write actually a lot of my messages for the guys in a great way, I hope. So, because the world is really confusing, isn't it? There are so many messages coming at all of us about who we are supposed to be, right? And there's so much of it now. It's like an onslaught. Social media everywhere. But tonight I want us to focus on one truth. The Bible and the Holy Spirit need to be our guide to cut through the confusions of the world. That has not changed, right? If we truly believe in the power of the words of the Bible and the power of an active Holy Spirit guiding our life, that our Creator loves us and is an active part of our life, and that Jesus came to this world as an example for our life, our lives wouldn't be so confusing. I'm going to say that again. If we truly believed in the power of the words of the Bible and the ability of the Holy Spirit to guide us, and a God that loves us and actively participates in our life, and that Jesus came to the world as our example, we wouldn't be so confused. Because it's all there for us, right? We have not changed. People have not changed over time. Like, the way we were designed by God has not changed over time. Right? Because you can dig up the bones of a guy from, whatever, 3,000 years ago. Still looks like the bones of a guy from now. It does. We really haven't changed. We shouldn't be so confused. We would simply follow what the Bible tells us and what the Holy Spirit leads us to do, right? It would be simple. We'd have like this childlike faith. There wouldn't be any confusions or layers that we have to go through in our mind. We would pray or press in or read and gain revelation and do it. Am I right? Is it that, that simple? We look in the Bible and say, what kind of a wife am I supposed to be? What kind of a husband am I supposed to be? What kind of a father am I supposed to be? What kind of a coworker am I supposed to be? What kind of a person am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to manage my finances? How am I supposed to manage my feelings? How am I supposed to think about myself? It's all in there. As a therapist, I have read a lot of psychology books. It's all wrapped up in the Bible. In fact, I love it when my field or profession thinks they've come up with something new, like fasting. Fasting is like the new trend. Fast, intermittent fasting is supposed to be really good for your like metabolism stuff. I don't do it, but I heard it's really good. <laughs> supposed to be a way to clear out your mind, right? I don't know, fasting's in there. Am I right? Yeah. Every day in my own life, this is what I pray for. Every day. I want fresh revelation for myself. And I want fresh revelation for the people God brings in my life. I have this unique place, especially with this church, of serving you in a unique way. And it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. I'm so blessed. But in that, I sometimes know what you're all confused about. Just saying, okay. I think we all long for clarity and peace in all of this confusion. I want to know who I'm supposed to be. I want to know how I'm supposed to behave. And I know the Bible and the Holy Spirit is going to tell me not only how to be a woman and a neighbor and a friend, but I have a Holy Spirit that's going to tell me how to be uniquely me in the best way possible, right? Because I want to be used in the way in which God designed me right? Because if I do that and I step out in obedience, like being right here right now, which is so uncomfortable for me still, just saying, my people who know me well know that, okay? But my will is to be obedient to what God asks me to do. And I will tell you this, I will tell you this, I've been at, working with people for 31 years, okay? I will tell you this, if you are obedient to what God tells you, he will bless it every single time. But when God created us, he gave us this great big thing called our self-will. Our self-will, right? Because God didn't want slaves. 
He wanted people who entered into relationships with him willingly. Right? He wants us to come to him and say, I'm going to do the thing you tell me to do. Without thought, without layers of confusion, I'm just going to do that thing. That friend you told me I should call, I'm just going to call them. That person you told me I should text, I'm just going to text them. That person you told me I should mentor, I'm just going to mentor them. I don't know where that's going to go, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right? That's how I live my life. And I'm happier now at 51 than I probably ever really have been. I'm just saying. There's some circumstances in my life that are tough, but circumstances in my life can be tough and I can still be at peace because I lean on Jesus. I know where to run, right? For, for the, about a month there when I was being grandma, it was tough for me to get here. I'm telling you, I like crawled in here after three or four weeks like, like I was going through a desert. Like, oh, please, Lord, right? This is where I need to be. I'm thirsty. So I want to take a minute and look at some of the miracles in the Bible because we all want that, right? We all want a revelation. We all want something new. We all want change. We all want something new. And if you think about most of the miracles in the Bible, I'm not going to say all because there are theologians in here much more studied than me, but I have looked. I won't say a definitive statement, but I think if you look at most of the miracles in the Bible, they happened because the person receiving the miracle bent their self-will. They did as they were told or as they were called. I believe that. So I'm going to give you some examples. So when Jesus healed the lame man, this is in John 5, 13. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was a pool of Bethesda. Sorry, I'm tripping over myself. With five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? He said, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up, right? Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So he had to enter into that with God, right? He had to enter into that. He had to do the thing. He had to stand up. When Jesus healed the possessed man or the demoniac, right? So Jesus is, is getting in the boat with all of his disciples. And this guy who'd been living up in the graveyard, right? We all know this story. Like, knew that Jesus was coming. His spirit, Jesus had reached out to him. And he took that little piece of himself that still was his self-will. And he got to the beach when Jesus got off the boat. He had to activate that piece of himself that sometimes we all feel like that, right? We feel confused. We feel like we've got 9,000 things coming at us. And the last thing we want to do is read our Bible, pray, and press in. What do we want to do? We want to do the earthly stuff. We want to Netflix and chill, drink a little too much wine, do something a little crazy, buy some stuff, right? And you're going to hear me say this many times, but you cannot answer a world, a spiritual problem with a worldly solution. So there was a woman with the issue of blood. She had to get through the crowd and touch the hem of Jesus' garment, right? The miracle of filling of the nets, where they actually had to put their net over onto the other side of the boat. I'm sure Jesus could have just had the fish jump in the boat. But he was like, you have to do something. So I think one of the most impactful miracles in the Bible, though, was the miracle of Jesus calming the sea. So I'm going to look at the passages from Matthew. And when we get to this chapter in Matthew, which is chapter 8, before anyone gets in the boat, the disciples have already been with Jesus as he healed a leper and also healed the Roman officer's servant. Does everybody remember this? We're all pretty biblically knowledgeable in this room. Jesus actually said the Roman officer had more faith than most of his followers. Because that guy was just like, no, you just speak it. You just speak it, and it's going to come into fruition. I I don't need you to come. Just speak it. Right? So I'm going to pick up where Jesus heals many people, which is um, Matthew 8, 14. And when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. 
This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sickness and removed our diseases. So the disciples had already been with him and saw all those miracles, right? But then we get to where Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. And suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking up into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. When his disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. So the disciples had already seen Jesus do all of these miracles for other people, right? But now they needed one. Now they needed one. And Jesus responded to them, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. I mean, Jesus must have just been like, are you serious? Are you even serious? You have watched, you're waking me up. You have watched me heal all of these people. You have watched me do all of these things. And yet you have this little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. And the disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Those disciples finally themselves were in desperate need of a miracle. That was the difference. They were the one that needed the miracle. So when Jesus does a miracle for us, we need to bend our self-will to his guidance and direction to receive that miracle. And usually, the miracles that happen to us and in us strengthen our face mightily. So how many people have one area in their life where they want a miracle? Or they want a fresh revelation or they want something new? I do all the time. How many people just want that change in their life and want to wake up peaceful every day, right? Because this world is insane. I live in it every day, all day. I hear things that you guys would just be like, are you even serious? I mean, eight-year-olds looking at pornography through this stupid video game called Roadblocks. Anybody's kids on YouTube or playing video games not supervised, please don't let them do that. I'm just saying. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there. This world needs a miracle. So many people confused. Hmm. So as Christians, we are called to a life of reliance on God and self-discipline. When we ask the Holy Spirit to come into us, Qualities are given to us through the Holy Spirit, and they're described in Isaiah 11. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. People think of fear in the Lord, and sometimes they take it as like, we should be afraid because he's looking for reasons to hate us and reasons to punish us. If anybody's ever gone through a dry season in their life, I've done that. I went through kind of a hard-hearted dry season. A few years ago, thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing me out of that one. My fear of the Lord is that the Lord will ever leave my presence. That's my fear of the Lord. I don't want to do things intentionally or purposeful that make him leave my presence because he can't be around me. I don't ever want that again. It's a dry, desperate, lonely place. And you know what? When I was in that lonely place, what I did? I just filled myself up with the world right? Because the world offers all kinds of comfort. But I had a spiritual problem, and I was giving it a worldly solution. So it didn't work. And thankfully, Jesus kept chasing me. Thank you. Goodness, Lord. That was some rough stuff. So we need to press in and cultivate these gifts to gain their fruit, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's described in Galatians. So you have it in you. When you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life, which most of us did when we were little bitty, right? The Holy Spirit came into you and infused you with certain things, right? And now you have to cultivate that to get the fruits. Is anybody with me? Is everybody sleeping? That, I always have to teach when there's no drummer, and I feel like we just kind of get meditative in the worship, <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, Lord, wake them up. It's Saturday night. But the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and 
Self-control. There's no law against these things. Self-control. We need to have self-control. We need to have self-discipline and bend our self-will, especially over our words and our actions. Because our words are powerful. So I'm going to highlight this for a second. This is how powerful words are. People come into my office and they remember something that was awful that somebody said to them in second grade. And that has become part of their identity. That's who I am. So in the beginning, God created them the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, God spoke. He spoke everything into an existence. In the first chapter of John, John states, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in that instance, the word is Jesus, right? The word, word, was Jesus. Satan cannot curse us. Satan cannot curse us. So I think he tries to provoke us into cursing ourselves or situations or others through the words that we choose. We can all cut really deeply with our words, can't we? Words create create our reality. What we say to someone creates our reality. We can bring darkness into our home through our words. We can bring darkness into a situation through our words. Here's a, here's a really great example. I use this one all the time at work. So there was a little boy, and he really liked to bother his sister and call his sister bad names. So his father said, every single time you call your sister a bad name, you got to go all the way down to that fence post on the end of the field and put a nail in it. So eventually, the little boy decides, I should probably stop calling my sister bad names because I'm sick of walking to that fence post down at the, bottom, at the end of the field. That's a long way. So he gets better, and his father says, all right, come on now. We're going to go get all the nails out of that fence post. So he goes down there, and he pulls all the nails out of the fence post, and the little boy's feeling so good. And the father said, but now look at the fence post. You can say you're sorry all day long. You can, all day long, but it doesn't take back what you said. It doesn't take back what you said. So where do you start You just don't open your mouth. I can leave now. I'm anything at all. That is one of the the main things I say in couples counseling. You can have amazing fights with somebody in your head and keep it in your head. And if you, we get consequenced in the world for what we let out of our mouth. That's what we get consequenced for. That's what creates reality is what we let out of our mouth. But a lot of times, honestly, we're like children. I want to say it. I want to scream it. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. I have no self-control. I have no self-discipline. And everybody around me is just going to have to put up with it. I'm going to tell you, the best apology is changed behavior, people. If you apologize and don't change your behavior, mm, yeah, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're sorry, and I don't believe you can change it if you do it enough. Right? The other thing is this. Our choices create our lives, and they impact others around us. That's our actions. So if you're having this amazing fight inside your head, right, and you're, like, keeping your mouth shut, which is awesome and great, but you're slamming doors and you're throwing stuff, you're still inviting anger into your home. You're still inviting anger into your relationships, into your workplace, into your car. Right? Why? Why? Why would you want to not be in a peaceful place? There is, there's really not that much in this world worth getting that worked up about. And usually getting all worked up doesn't really help stuff anyhow. So I want you to remember this. A disciplined self-will going after a God-ordained goal is unstoppable. 
To find and live in God's design for you is your path. God will never ask you to be or accomplish something he has not designed you to do. A disciplined self-will going after a God-ordained goal is unstoppable. To find and live in God's design for you is your path. God will never ask you to be or accomplish something he has not designed you to do. At 51, I can look back on my life and everything I've experienced, I use it every day because I've just stepped into his design for me, right? I don't think about things too much. If you've ever been in my office or you've met with me one-on-one, it just comes all pouring out. Sometimes people look at me like, huh? What? Oh, that was, that was tough. Sometimes it's just a connection. But I, don't, I just don't stop anymore. Because even when I don't trust me, which is 99% of the time, I trust God And when I'm standing up here, I trust the leadership of this church, that this church believes I should be up here. (laughs) And y'all keep coming back when I'm here. So, you know, is that what it is? (laughs) That was witty. And I know you didn't mean it, Dita. That's okay. That's okay. So. God wants to do something new in your life. He wants to change your life. He wants to partner with you in figuring out your design. We just need to reach out and do the things he tells us to do. This isn't rocket science. So tonight, I'm asking you to reach out for something different than maybe what you've been doing and commit to change because this world is confusing. And people are acting in that confusion confusion, because the messages from the world are loud and in our face all day through all the forms of media we consume. I would bet we all consume each day way more of the world than we do of our spiritual world. I do. I mean, my whole profession is in the world. But here's the new thought. We cannot put a worldly answer to a spiritual problem. As spirit-filled people, that will never feel peaceful for us. If you keep stumbling over something in your life, if you keep going around the same tree, if the fruits of the spirit are not pouring out of you, my guess would be you have a spiritual problem. It's so quiet when I say things like that. I don't know. (laughs) So, God has really pressed on my heart for a long time now to address the confusion happening in men. Like a long time, like probably a year, right, Abby? Probably a year, because I think Abby was one of the first persons that heard this stuff. But I never get an opportunity to talk to men. (laughs) I I mean, men's group don't ask me. (laughs) But I have a really unique place in men's lives, because oftentimes I'm their therapist. I have participated in men's healing from that confusion, and it is so amazing. It is so amazing. Now now when men walk into my office, I'm like almost giddy. They gotta think I'm weird. I'm just like, oh, a guy, yes. Now I love working with women. I work with a lot of women. I love teenage girls for sure. I love little kids, I work with a lot of those, but Here's been my experience. When I get a man in there, that affects a marriage. That affects children. That affects, just, it just goes on and on and on. It's this huge ripple effect. All of a sudden, they are hearing affirming things about who they are. I speak life into them. You know what men look at me all the time and say? I can't handle my wife's emotions. They say that all the time. I want you to know this. You are perfectly designed and wired by God to manage your wife's emotions. Absolutely. Our emotions are not always super fun for us either. I'm just going to let you know that. They're not. Like, we're straight up crazy sometimes, and we know it in our head. We know it when we're doing it. We, 
Becky's going, I admit it. I usually admit it. If you don't keep track of that week on the calendar, men, you're missing a golden opportunity. Just keep track. God wired us with all these emotions for his purpose. And I'll say one of the confusions with women is that we think we should be men and not have so many emotions because that's what the world tells me. I mean, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Daughter of feminism. Daughter of like, I can do all things a man can do, not like I hate men. That's a different feminism. But one of those messages I for sure got was don't be so emotional. If you're so emotional, what are you ladies? This begins with a D and the second word is a Q. You're a drama queen. If you express all your emotions, you're a drama queen. If you express them all at work, you're needy. You're not strong enough. One of the most healing things I ever did in my life was just accept my emotions and be okay with the fact that I'm an emotional person. It's so freeing. That's how God designed me. My emotions make me get up at 2 a.m. with that crying baby and remember everything about all the people I love. Except birthdays. I really am not good at that. But everything else I'm really, really good at. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay. I don't want y'all thinking I'm perfect up here because I'm not. Okay. So men have a lot of confusion. And I have had that unique opportunity to speak into men's lives. And I want to do that tonight. Because men, the world is coming after you, isn't it? If you are a politically conservative leaning white man in a Christian conservative church, you are at the top of the um, let's go get them crucifixion <laughs> within the media, right? I am shocked at how much social media says we don't need men anymore. It's so sad. Look at most of the sitcoms. Men are buffoons, aren't they? Incapable, incompetent buffoons. But that's not who you were designed to be. A man walking in peace with God is a powerful world changer. A man walking in peace with God is a powerful world changer. Like, I believe in the role of women, obviously. I think women need to have strong voices. But a man who is walking in step with God, I don't think there's anything more powerful. Because women, our natural inclination is we want to submit to that. We're wired that way. I have never had a even the most ticked off angry wife in my, in my office who doesn't want to submit to a good and godly man. I really just want to remind the men who you are because this world needs you so desperately. Men struggle with a lot of insecurity. There are very tender hearts behind all those walls. Men want to do well in their marriage and relationships with people, but because they have forgotten their design in place, they struggle with this insecurity. The cultural norms that used to be in place that taught boys how to be men are missing. Those things, such as fathers and mentors, were designed to teach boys how to be righteous men. That's just been disintegrated. Remember, there used to be a nobility in manhood. The prince that comes in and saves the day. A standard by which men operated. Recent studies have shown that one in four children are living in a fatherlessness home. So in my profession, when there starts to be a trend, then social researchers will actually study it. And one of the newly studied things is a term called fatherlessness. Fatherlessness is described as Kids growing up in a home where they not only don't have a father, don't have an adoptive father, stepfather, or a father figure in their life. Men, you want to impact manhood? Look around at all those boys that don't have a man in their life and step in. I work with a lot of women who go to church, and some of them are single moms. And one of the things they can't find is a man that actually wants to step into their child's life. The world needs you. Another recently 
studied phenomenon. You can look all this stuff up. There's so many research articles out there, I just didn't pin one for you. But go ahead and Google it. I ain't lying to you. Is um, Men are showing that they're more lonely than ever before. Three in five men, three out of five men are reporting that they're very lonely. Not just a little bit lonely, but very lonely. So I think men are thinking to themselves, what am I supposed to be doing? What is my significance in this world? Because the world is telling you you aren't significant, right? Am I wrong? The world is telling you you're not significant. Men feel insecure about their values to others and their abilities to manage relationships. Insecurity causes defensiveness. You've all told, heard me say that. It is difficult for us to be teachable when we're in a defensive place, even teachable from God's word. Insecurity in men, in my experience, also causes self-loathing, impatience, and frustration, and can be at the heart of some men's anger issues because they feel helpless and hopeless to change. At the root of a lot of anger is hurt, and men are being hurt a lot. I raise boys. I have two boys. Well, they're not boys anymore. They're 26 and 27, so they're not boys anymore. I remember listening to them when they were like 12, 13, 14 years old with their friends, hanging out with their friends. Y'all are cruel to each other. Man, you will find that one little speck of blood and just dive on it, like dive bomb on it like mosquitoes. Some men can take that. Some men can't. I think it plants insecurities in your lives. And when you don't then have these fathers and brothers and mentors to like fall back on, all you hear is that, that giving each other poop stuff. So the root of a lot of anger is hurt. Men are not given ready avenues to discuss their hurts and confusion. Insecurity, hurt, confusion leads to issues of anger, control, and selfishness. Men feel like they are consistently failing in most all of the things in their lives. Marriage, relationship, provision, especially in this economy, fatherhood, friendship, failing to handle their wives' emotions, failing to respond in the best way. One of the things I tell men and work with men a lot on is responding, not reacting. Respond, don't react, all of us. Respond, don't react. Respond in a way to a situation that you're going to feel good about tomorrow. That's self-discipline, people. But see, men are beautifully, beautifully wired to manage women's emotions because you're more logical. I love a man's logical brain. I really do. When, they, when I finally get a relationship with a man where he, like, trusts me, I, I will, on, I mean, have, I worked with one gentleman um, for, I don't know, probably four years now. And sometimes when, I, when we'll be talking with him and his wife and his wife will bring something up, he'll go, well, but you do, and you do, da-da-da, or, or that's not right, or, or, and I'll say, you know what, how about if we talk about it this way? And at first he'll get defensive and go, blah, 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 blah at me. Now I've gotten to the point where I kind of just look at him and I say, okay, here's the deal. We can argue about this for a while before you decide, yeah, I should try it Wendy's way, or you can just say that now. And he just looks at me and laughs. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll try it your way. Not because I'm a miraculous person, I'm not. But because men are hungry for, tell, just tell me. Just tell me. Men want to do well. They want to be valued. Can I get some men to say amen here? Amen. Somebody tell me amen. Because this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. So I want to look at, at Ephesians 5. I'm going to start with chapter 5, verse 15 because it just kind of reflects on some other things. It says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants to do in your life. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to start again in, in chapter, verse 21, about spirit-guided relationships between wives and husbands. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit yourself to your husband as to the Lord. For he is the husband... 
For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits itself to Christ, so you wives should submit yourself to husbands and everything. For husbands, this means love your wives. It's very strange that there's, there's really nowhere where women are commanded to love their husbands. I don't, I don't know why I caught that, but... Because God knows how we're designed. He knows what we're going to struggle with. He knows what we're going to struggle with. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washing by the cleansing of God's word. What woman does not want to submit to that? He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves himself, for a man who loves himself, loves his wife. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are all members of this body. So as the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined with his wife, and the two are united as one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Men, love your wives as you love yourself. You have to love yourself fully in order to love your wife. To me, that's what that scripture says. A man who loves himself can love his wife. If you don't love yourself because you're filled with shame and guilt and insecurities and confusion, you're not going to love your wife as well as you could. So, and I also love that there's so much um, comparison to the church, okay? And too bad Bob and Jake aren't here because I'm going to say some really nice stuff about them. So... Let's look at the example here of your home being like a church. So we've heard that before, men as priests of their home, right? So let's look at this church. Men of this church, I want you to ask yourself, why do you run to Pastor Bob or Pastor Jake while you're hurting? Because I know you all do. They're usually your first call. Why? Why do you run to Pastor Bob and Pastor Jake or some of the other male youth leaders, right, when you're hurting? Why are they the leaders in your life? See, leadership is something that is given by the person willing to be led. Unless you're going to take it through force. It's a gift, right? Everybody here in this church have decided Pastor Bob, Pastor Shar, Pastor Jake, and Pastor Abby are going to be our pastors. We're going to submit ourselves to their authority. Amen? Am I right? Okay. Why? That's exact. You just said verbatim my next sentence. So that must be God. We're just going to take it there. Because they have loved us so well. It is not because they've dominated over us. It's not because they've given us rules and regulations. It's because they've loved us so well. Jake and Bob work constantly and consistently on their own issues so they can be strong, clear-minded, and clear spiritual leaders for you. They step into your life. They affirm you. They tell you you can do better, Right? So men, if you compare your family to the church, are you doing that in your family? You want leadership over your family, over your workplace. You're wired to be leaders. You're wired to be leaders. I'm going to get to that, but you are wired to be leaders. But are you loving well so that leadership is given to you as a gift? You feel safe when you're with Bob and Jake, right? You feel safe to say what's hurting you? As husbands and fathers and coworkers, are you safe? What kind of a leader was Christ? Because it talks about being a leader like Christ was, right? Christ was a servant leader. He was not about himself or his own glory. He did not come as a political leader or a war chief to dominate over those around him. He was never selfish He washed the feet of those who followed him. That is an awesome responsibility. But men, you are beautifully wired to do that. The world needs you to do that. Your families need you to do that. I'm not saying to be a pushover man. 
Leadership is not pushover. Leadership is often doing what's tough and what's hard and what's not popular. The world needs strong leaders who are willing to do the tough things. Being a leader is not always about doing what is easy or pop- popular, but prayerfully f- fulfilling God's leading. Jesus found the talent of his followers and he drew that out. He asked them to grow spiritually and be challenged, but he accepted their God-given makeup. So I'm going to use Bob and Jake as examples. So I sit over there, okay? So I get to watch these guys a lot because my, my eyes just kind of wander because I just got a brain that's weird. Have you ever watched Bob watch Shar preach? Have you ever watched Jake watch Abby preach? It's not that. It is not that at all. It is like pure, unadulterated adoration and pride, right? Do you think it'd be easier for Jake and Pastor Bob to not be in ministry with their wives? Some, some husbands and wives, it's hard to run a popsicle stand together. <laughs> right? But they saw something in their wives, and even though it was going to be more difficult for them, they drew it out. They saw God's calling on their life, and even though it was more difficult for them, they drew it out. Even though it probably means sometimes they don't have a five-course meal at home and they're getting ready. You know, they come home at the end of the day. They've got a partner that's just as wore out as they are. They saw that and they drew it out. I'm going to talk about Brandon and Bobby for a second because y'all just got a cat and a dog and it just didn't correlate, okay? So I don't know Brandon super well, but I know Bobby super well. Um, And Brandon and Bobby are a little bit different from each other, right? (laughs) But what Bob and Shar did is they saw the unique gifts within their children and they drew those out. There was no, hey, y'all got to be like each other. I know them. They do different things with each kid. Each kid has different passions. Are you doing that in your own family? Are you being the kind of leader you want for yourself? Jesus often went off on his own to be with his father and seek guidance, right? I had a moment one time of understanding how awesome that responsibility is for you men. Because this is what I know. Your wife and your children are going to follow you where you lead them. I have seen women bend and compromise their morals. Good Christian women. Watching porn with their husbands. Letting another woman into their bedroom. Because that's what they thought their husband said they needed. I've seen women scrap and fight for their marriages. You know, most women check out of their marriage about three years before they actually leave it. So if your wife is still nagging on you or talking to you about change, it's because she's still engaged in your marriage. Most of the time, by the time people get to couples counseling, the husband's like, well, I thought things had gotten better. She hasn't really said much in the last couple years. It didn't get better. She just stopped trying. See, Christ cared for his followers and he nurtured them to their best selves. Right? You are wired to be that way. You are designed to be that way. You are designed to look at your children and your wife and the people in your life. And if you're not married yet and you're standing in the hallway waiting for a wife, these are the things you need to learn. Because if we're standing in the hallway waiting for the door to open, it's because Jesus is saying, you still got some stuff to learn before I'm going to open that door. That's why we stand in the hallway. That's a good word. Okay? So we talk about, a lot about submission. Women talk a lot about submission. There's books on submission. There's podcasts on submission. We all agree it's very difficult. Okay? Especially women at 2022, probably. But God made us for such a time as this. But we all know it's hard. We admit it's hard. We talk about it being hard. And that's probably why God put that verse in there. Because he knew what we'd struggle with. It is true that I think most women, and I run with some, some real strength leader women, 
We are all at our best and most comfortable when we are in submission to a godly man. When we are in submission to a righteous man who's seeking the Lord's will for us. Again, not his own personal ease, but what would be best for him, for us, to do what God has, has for us. Like I said, I'm sure pastoral duties would be a lot easier if Jake and Abby were just at home. I mean, if Shar and Abby were at home. Men, you are called to put aside selfishness. And God knew this one was going to be difficult for you because you're wired for leadership. And leadership can lead to selfish desires. There's nothing better than a good leader. There's nothing worse than a bad leader. You ever heard that quote that says, people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses? I oftentimes challenge men to take all that stuff they know about the business world and put it into their family. They understand that. Like, oh, I should communicate with people and stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> he, God designed us. Do you get that? He, uh, he designed us understanding what our struggles might be. We don't surprise him. That's why it's in there. That's why it says, women, you're going to struggle with submission, so submit to yourself to your own husband. Men, you're going to struggle with selfishness. So become a leader like Christ who is not selfish, who is never selfish. God never asks us to be or accomplish or act in any other way than the way he designed us to be. He is asking men to be the leaders he describes because he designed you to be that leader. If you get out of your own selfish desires and get out of your own head and get out of what the world tells you, that's how you are designed. One of my own personal mottos is I'm always trying to get myself back to the garden. That means I'm always trying to get myself back to my original design before the world corrupted me and corrupted my thoughts and my behaviors, right? And sometimes when people come into my office and they have a struggle, and I'll say, well, where'd that come from? Because you weren't born that way. Where'd that come from? You weren't born that way. So I want to look at Genesis chapter 2, and I want to look at when God created men. So the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens. Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered the land, and then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. So why did God make you? Why did God make us? Like, I picture God, this amazing artist, this, this amazing artist. Like, he is more amazing than what fits inside of my brain. I mean, there's so many scientific evidence now, like mitochondrial Eve, that all people really do come from one woman. That's scientifically proven now. It's crazy. It's not crazy. It's just God. God's like, y'all want to do science? I'll do some science. <laughs> We can do some science. So why did God make us? He made this beautiful world, right? I love that he thought that I might like purple flowers and, and Char might like, well, no plants at all that she can't grow easily, but she might like yellow flowers <laughs> and Becky might like red flowers. I might like elephants and Colton might like giraffes. It's so diverse. This world is amazing. Have you ever actually looked up and thought about how amazing this planet is, how incredible it is to be here having this earthly experience right now. Because that's what you are, is you're a spirit having an earthly experience. Right? Why did God make you? Why did God make us? Somebody answer. Why did God make us? To be in relationship with him, right? God made us to be in relationship with him. To harness our self-will, come willingly into a loving relationship with him, Right? And then God made men. He didn't make me. You, they might take away my girl card for that. They didn't. They made men. He made a man, right? To be in relationship with him. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostril and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he placed the man that he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's a whole bunch of stuff here about, 
about rivers flowing, and I'm going to really butcher the names of the rivers. So there's some rivers flowing. All right. The last one was the Euphrates. The fourth branch was called the Euphrates, and I know that one. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. He made you, men, and placed you in the middle of his creation to tend and watch over it. He made you, men, and placed you in the middle of his creation to tend and watch over it. Now is not the time to check out. Because this world is a mess. And then the Lord God warned him, you may eat freely of all the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat of its fruit, you're going to die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. It is not good for a man to be alone. Why wouldn't it be good for a man to be alone? Know any single adult men? They get lonely, right? I believe that men take all the love that they had for their mother and transfer it to their wife when they get married. That becomes their person. As a mother of sons, I I was really all about it. I mean, not that they don't love me. They do love me. But that primary love in their life should be their wife. But that's what we do. That's what men do. They take that need and that adoration for nurturing and they give it to your wife. And wives, sometimes we don't handle it that well. We can be straight up mean and cutting with our words. We say, women will say things to men that if a man said it to them, it would crush them. We all criticize way too much. If you're a a couple that's worked with me, sometimes my entire assignment is to not criticize each other. So God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. Why? Because you are designed in God's image. And God needed relationship. God needed relationship. So he knew you were going to need relationship. He knew you were going to be lonely because our creator must have been lonely enough to create all this. Your wife is not your adversary. So God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one, and he gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. And the Lord saw that. And so the Lord said, you're going to go into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from his rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she will be called woman because she was taken from man. She was taken from me. Marriage done right is beautiful. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Women's emotion meets a man's logic. They help us be a little bit less emotional, and we help them be a little bit more emotional. Put together in wholeness, it's beautiful. So, this explains why a man leaves his father and a mother is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Your your wife was designed for you. She is not your adversary. She is your helper. A man and a wife should feel no shame about anything with each other. Their hurts, their feelings, their expectations, what's going wrong, what's not working for them, all of it. If it is you and she against the problem, you'll beat it every time. If you get it to where it's you and she against each other, it's not going to happen. And through your union with your wife, you become a creator. And you create little people in your image to tend and care for in God's creation and to have relationship with. And in this way, God's world continues. So men, stand up. 
take the place God designed for you because you were designed and beautifully and wonderfully equipped to be all that God says you are. Tend and care for this creation. Don't walk away now because this world really needs you. <laughs>